What if Palpatine had fallen into the lava on Mustafar while trying to save Anakin? What would happen then? Let's find out. So in this alternate Star Wars timeline, after Darth Sidious walked down the high ground, two hours left of Darth Vader and then brought his hand close to Vader's forehead, Vader, in his rage and confusion, not even able to think or accurately process what was going on, would unintentionally do something as Sidious's palm approached his forehead. You see, despite Vader's grievous injuries at Obi-Wan's hand, the neural interface bridging the stump that was Vader's right arm with his cybernetic prosthetic remained intact. And at this moment, when Sidious leaned down next to him, the microprocessors embedded in Vader's synthetic limb interpreted urgent signals firing from the raw nerve endings in Vader's severed arm. These signals sourced through the biotechnological junction where organic tissue met durasteel. And in response, Vader's cybernetic right hand, a masterpiece of galactic technology, began to respond. Servo motors engaged, tendons made of reinforced durasteel tensed, and the robotic fingers closed around Palpatine's wrist with an iron grip. And then, before he could react, Vader flung Sidious forward using his cybernetic right arm, sending Sidious headfirst into a river of fire. Vader then heard what sounded like a scream over the sounds of flowing molten rock, but that quickly disappeared. Vader didn't even know what he had done, and following this, a few short moments later, Vader saw, through his blurred vision, two clone troopers approaching him with a medical capsule. The troopers then placed the capsule down next to Vader, and then injected the Sith with something, which would be the last thing Vader would feel for a long while. So, what happened was that, in his disoriented state, Vader threw Sidious into lava, unaware of his actions. Following this, Sidious's clones arrived with a medical capsule for Vader, but by then, Sidious was nowhere to be found. But not having time to search for Sidious, with Vader being in the state he was in, the two clone troopers would call for backup to search for Sidious, while they took Vader to Coruscant. And these backup troopers who arrived to look for Sidious would eventually figure that, given everything they know, the old Emperor Palpatine had most likely fallen into the lava while trying to rescue Vader or General Skywalker as they knew him. Meanwhile, back on Coruscant, Vader would be brought to the Grand Republic medical facility. But with Sidious being too dead to give any orders, it would fall upon Masa Meta, Palpatine's right-hand man, to determine how best to fix Vader. And Masa Meta, not knowing what Sidious would have wanted, would tell the medical droids to give General Skywalker the very best treatment and cybernetics that the Empire had to offer, as credits were obviously of no issue, and neither were legal regulations on cybernetics usage, which, as you will see in this video, were in place for a reason. So in the days following this, Vader, while still being kept sedated, would be placed into a bacta tank to heal his body as much as possible to prepare him for surgery. This was done to minimize the pain that Vader would experience, again, since Sidious was dead. So in this new timeline, with Sidious gone, Vader would be given much better care, and he would not experience any physical pain. But since Vader had essentially been placed into a medically induced coma while he was recuperating in bacta, he would experience nightmares terrible visions where he kept seeing Padme and his mother and every other painful memory he had on repeat. Vader's mind would be constantly barraged with these visions, and eventually, they would begin to drive him mad. Because due to the extensive nature of his injuries, Vader needed to be kept in Bacta for an extended period of time, during which he was not allowed to wake up, basically. And during this time, when Vader was in Bacta, many things would happen to the Empire. The Emperor's death would obviously be a big topic of discussion, but ultimately, Palpatine's death would be ruled as an accident and no one would be blamed for it. But then, the conversation in the Senate would shift to why Palpatine was in the Mustafar system. An investigation would be ordered into this, and as a result, the bodies of the Separatist leaders would be found on Mustafar. All of them dead, with lightsaber wounds on their bodies. So this would lead to further confusion in the Senate, because if all the Jedi were traitors, then who killed the Separatist leaders? So because of all this, Masa Meta would be forced to clear the air, basically, and inform the Imperial Senate that Anakin Skywalker had stayed loyal to the Empire, and that he was sent to Mustafar by the Emperor to arrest the Separatist leaders after they were found hiding out there. Meta would go on to say that the Separatist leaders refused to surrender and attacked General Skywalker, leaving him grievously injured. General Skywalker was saved by a battalion of clones who were led directly by the late Emperor Palpatine. They managed to save General Skywalker, but our brave Emperor unfortunately perished on Mustafar. This is what Masa Meta would say to the Senate. Many would find this believable and perfectly reasonable, but still, many of the Senate would wish to hear this from General Skywalker directly. And as a result, Masa Meta, wanting a quick resolution to his troubles, would decide to have Vader's treatment sped up so that he may be woken up and be made Emperor. He alone won't be able to keep this new empire running for long, Masa Meta knew this. So, Masa Meta needed 
Emperor Skywalker to take charge as soon as possible. And so, following this, after receiving confirmation from the medical droids that Vader was healed enough to undergo cybernetic surgery, Masa Mera would order the procedures to be done as soon as possible, and the droids would do so. The droids would take Vader out of the back that he's been in for nearly a month at this point, and the surgery would begin. The Sith Lord would be equipped with the most advanced and highly regulated cybernetic enhancements that the galaxy had ever produced. These enhancements, often restricted due to their immense power and potential danger they posed, would transform Vader into a being of unprecedented might. His limbs, now composed of a rare alloy far stronger than Durasteel, would give him strength capable of crushing Duracrete. The joints in these limbs would be fitted with microhydraulics, granting Vader agility and speed that defied natural physics. His hands especially would be equipped with tactile sensors so sensitive they could detect the slightest change in air pressure, and the grip they offered would be strong enough to bend metal. Vader's chest piece and respiratory system would be a marvel of bioengineering, combining life support with an advanced combat armor, made of the same indestructible alloy. This new system would not only filter out toxins and regulate his breathing, but it would also enhance his stamina, allowing Vader to excel himself at peak capacity for extended periods without fatigue. But perhaps the most controversial of these enhancements would be the neural interface implanted directly into Vader's brain. This interface would enhance his cognitive processing and reaction time. It would provide him with near instantaneous ability to process and react to his surroundings, making Vader an even more formidable warrior. As Vader's surgery progressed, Masa Mera would push the medical team to their limits, insisting on the quickest possible recovery time essentially not giving Vader's mind enough time to recover. Ameda did not think that necessary, and he had bigger things on his mind. The galaxy would be waiting to see the new Emperor, and Ameda knew that Vader, or Emperor Skywalker's intimidating presence, would quell the issues in the Senate quickly, and allow him, Mas Ameda, to go back to being the right hand of the most powerful person in the galaxy. But once Vader emerged from the medical facility, he would be more machine than man. His body would now be a testament to the galaxy's technological prowess. His mind, however, would be a maelstrom of pain, anger, and confusion, exacerbated by the continuous nightmares and invasive cybernetic enhancements, something that Masamera could not sense. Anyways, once Vader was out of surgery, Masamera would order the droids to bring him out of sedation. And this would prove to be a very very bad decision, which even Masamera would see as soon as Vader woke and stood up. And although he had thought of many urgent things to say to Vader when he woke up, seeing the over 7 feet tall Vader, Masamera would go silent, in fear. Vader would look around and then ask Masamera in a modulated deep electronic voice where Padme Amidala was. And after hesitating for a moment, Masamera would say that Padme Amidala had died and that her funeral was held on Naboo over a month ago, and Vader would sense that Masamera was not lying. In the original timeline, when he was told that Padme died, Vader attempted to force choke Palpatine, but Palpatine countered with force lightning. But here, in this new timeline, as Vader is told of Padme's fate, Palpatine is gone. And at this moment, when he's told that Padme is no more, Vader would also recall what he did. He killed Padme and Palpatine on Mustafar. And having realized this, just like in the original timeline, here too, Vader would go into a rage. But unlike in the original timeline, this version of Cyborg Vader is far, far superior. There were no weaknesses in his body, he was impervious to blasters, but what makes him really dangerous here is that this Vader is insane. More so than he was in the original timeline, because here, this Vader had been forced to endure his most painful memories over and over again for the duration of his medically induced coma, which was over a month. And so, this unhinged super Vader, I suppose, after finding out that Padme had died, would use the Force to pull Masamera to a cybernetic arm, which was massive enough, by the way, to accommodate Masamera's entire head. And then, using these huge metal arms of his, Vader would crush Masamera's head like a kadu egg. So following this, the enraged Vader would crush the medical doors around him, and then the clones who were with Masamera. And then Vader would attempt to leave the hospital. At this point, shuttles full of clone troopers would be dispatched to take Vader out. But due to Vader being impervious to blaster bolts here, the clones would not be able to impart any damage to Vader, and all the clones who went after Vader would die by Vader's hand. And also, this would be happening in broad daylight, in one of the most populated areas of Upper Coruscant, so it would quickly become news and spread like wildfire over the holonet. And soon, it would be revealed that this cybernetic monster 
was General Skywalker, because in this timeline, Master Meta had made it public that Anakin survived and was now being treated in the hospital. So the Holonet would quickly figure out that this cybernetic thing was Skywalker. The news headlines over the Holonet would essentially say that after his treatment, the war hero General has gone crazy. Anyways, after having dealt with the clones and after him, Vader would then attempt to make his way over to the former Jedi Temple. He wanted to be somewhere familiar, that would be the only thought in Vader's deranged, crazy mind at this moment. As he attempted to make his way over to the temple, the clones and the Coruscant security forces would again attempt to stop him, but all would fail. Vader would essentially kill all who stood in his way. Some he would kill with the aid of the Force, and others he would destroy by driving his metallic fist through their heads. Although his potential in the Force is still reduced even in this timeline, the advanced cybernetics gave Vader superhuman abilities that in some senses made up for the Force abilities that he lost. Vader was indestructible now. So after everyone they sent after Vader died, the clone commanders and Coruscant security would immediately evacuate the area Vader was in, and after realizing Vader was headed to the temple, it would also be evacuated. And this would prove to be a wise move, and Vader would reach the temple without having to kill anyone else. And once inside, Vader would feel a strange pull towards the restricted section of the temple. And Vader would follow this pull. And once he got to the restricted section, the ancient security droid inside the restricted section would identify Vader as Anakin Skywalker. Only masters are permitted into this section of the archives, Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker. This would be what the droid would say as soon as Vader entered. But before the droid could say anything else, Vader would crush it. And then, having done so, Vader would stride into the restricted section of the temple. A place once off limits to him as Anakin Skywalker, a place where he once thought he could find the path to save Padme. So side note, in Revenge of the Sith, the reason why Anakin gets so angry when he's denied the rank of Master is because he could not enter the restricted section of the archives, where Anakin believed he could find forbidden knowledge on how to keep Padme from dying. Anyways, in the restricted archives, surrounded by the most sacred and ancient Jedi artifacts, Vader's fury would reach a feverish peak. He would even feel like wanting to bite off his own tongue. Vader would then begin demolishing everything in his path. Ancient texts, artifacts, all of which reminded him of how he not only failed, but in fact, killed Padme. Yet, as he wrecked havoc, something unexpected happened. Among the destruction he slayed, Vader's eyes would fall upon a holocron, a Sith holocron. This artifact, pulsating with dark energy, seemed to call out to him. And as Vader approached the holocron, it activated, unveiling his secrets in a swirl of sinister red light. The Holocron spoke to Vader of forbidden knowledge of powers that could bend the very fabric of reality, and among these secrets was a particularly enticing promise, the potential to bring back the dead. It whispered ancient Sith rituals that could pierce the veil between life and death, offering Vader a sliver of hope to resurrect Padme, almost as if the Holocron knew what Vader wanted. The revelation struck Vader with an overwhelming force, his mind already teetering on the brink of madness, grappled with the possibility of undoing his greatest mistake. The Holocron's knowledge was vast, containing not just secrets of life and death, but also untapped dark side abilities that could augment Vader's already formidable powers. And so, realizing the complexity of the knowledge he was dealing with, Vader knew he needed to understand every facet of this dark wisdom. He decided to enter a deep meditation, a state where he could shift through the Holocron's knowledge. And so, Vader began his meditation with the Holocron and his knowledge being his only focus. So as all this was happening, the Senate would be in turmoil. The acting Emperor Master Meta was dead, and now General Skywalker, or whatever he is now, has gone on a rampage in the upper levels of Coruscant, that too before the eyes of the entire galaxy as all this was broadcasted over the whole net. A solution to this madness must be discovered quickly. This was a sentiment shared by the entirety of the Senate. So they went over possible solutions. Seeing as how Vader had not left the temple in a while because of his meditation, blowing up the 25,000 year old Jedi temple would become a popular idea. But some in the Senate, like Mon Mothma and Bail Organa, who were fond of the Jedi, opposed this. They would argue that Skywalker was a Jedi and that his sensitivity to the Force would allow him to sense if they tried something crude like sending a large explosive his way. Instead, Bill Organa and those who supported him would suggest an alternative. And this alternative would be halting Order 66 so that the remaining Jedi may be called back to Coruscant to deal with the situation with General Skywalker. There would be dissenting voices against this argument, but after Bail Organa explains how it is senseless to order the execution of every single Jedi over the mysteries of four masters, many of these said dissenting voices would go silent, and eventually, the Senate would agree with halting Order 66 and calling the Jedi back to Coruscant. However, many in the Senate still want to just try and blow up the temple, and using the support of these senators who want to blow up the temple, Moff Tarkin, 
who also believed that destroying the temple would be the best option, would plan and prepare to do the same as soon as possible. So ultimately, both options for dealing with the monster in the temple, as the Olanet had labeled Vader, would be in progress at the same time. And so, Order 66 would be called off and the surviving Jedi would be invited back to Coruscant. Many Jedi would return as a result, but Obi-Wan and Yoda would remain skeptical. They would have been aware of the recent events involving General Skywalker on Coruscant and the death of Palpatine, but still, Obi-Wan and Yoda would only choose to return after Bail Organa personally took the time to convince the two masters that this was not a trick and that the capital, Coruscant, needs their help. As for Ahsoka Tano, however, immediately upon hearing that the Jedi Purge has been ordered to stop, she would choose to return. She would have been wanting to return ever since she found out that Anakin is alive, but caution would have kept her away. But now, with Order 66 being officially called off, she would return to Coruscant. So soon after, many Jedi, including Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Ahsoka, would be on Coruscant, including those who were imprisoned by the Empire, the likes of Master Luminara and Dooley. So following this, the Jedi and those who supported their return would discuss how to deal with General Skywalker. This meeting would be held in 500 Republica, which in case you didn't know is the most prestigious and exclusive residential tower located in the Senate District on Coruscant. Also, a quick side note, in this timeline, Obi-Wan and Yoda would explain to everyone that Anakin had turned to the dark side and became Darth Vader. Because at this point, with the entire galaxy knowing that it was Anakin Skywalker in that cybernetic suit, there would be no point in holding Anakin's turn to the dark side a secret. Ahsoka in particular would be very surprised at hearing this, but it would answer a lot of our questions. But without dwelling on it, she would join the discussion on how to deal with Lord Vader. Anyways, as the discussions progressed, some of the Jedi would be of the opinion that they should just charge into the temple and take on Skywalker. But Master Yoda, after finding out about all the destruction that Vader has already caused and the cybernetic enhancements he's been given, would argue that they would not be able to destroy Skywalker with brute force. And instead, realizing the magnitude of the situation, Yoda would suggest a forbidden ritual to deal with Lord Vader. And this ritual in question was something known as a Thought Bomb. So a Thought Bomb, as Yoda would explain, is an ancient Sith ritual. It involves channeling the dark side to create a massive explosion of force energy, capable of annihilating the consciousness of any force-sensitive being caught in its blast radius. So this would undoubtedly deal with Vader despite his augmentations and power. Master Yoda, deeply troubled and against his better judgment, proposed this drastic measure due to the unprecedented threat Vader posed, which Yoda understood better than most. The usual methods of combat were futile against this new, cybernetically enhanced Vader, who was not only physically formidable, but also mentally unstable and immensely strong at the dark side of the Force. The powerful Master Yoda knew this. So, upon being told of this plan, some Jedi, including Obi-Wan, would be unsure about it. But Yoda would say that there are far few Jedi left to rebuild the Order, and that they cannot risk losing more. This was true. All who listened would realize this. They cannot risk directly attacking Vader. So then Yoda would be asked how they can perform this ritual. At this point, Yoda would look across the course of skyline to the temple in the distance and say, the help of a Sith we need. This would confuse everyone. How are we supposed to get Anakin to help us? Ahsoka would wonder. And at this moment, almost as if he read her mind, Yoda would turn to Ahsoka and say, there is another. And so following this, Yoda would explain to his confused audience the story of Darth Momin. So Momin was an ancient Sith who wanted to appease the dark side with his art. Yoda would explain how Momin was eventually killed by the Jedi as he was trying to destroy a city and freeze its inhabitants in time, a millisecond before they died. Momin believed that these statues of people trapped in time with pure fear on their face would be an art piece worthy of the dark side. But anyways, the reason Yoda would be going over all this is because when Momin died, his spirit did not leave the material world. Instead, it possessed his mask. And if anyone were to put on this mask of Darth Momin, they would essentially become Momin, or rather, they would be possessed by Momin's spirit. So Yoda would explain that with Darth Momin's help, they could quite possibly perform the Thought Bomb ritual and destroy Vader. Because despite his vast knowledge, Yoda did not know the exact intricacies of this Sith ritual. So ultimately, Yoda would say that they need to enter the temple and retrieve Momin's mask, which was stored in the restricted section. So with this plan decided on, what the Jedi needed now was a way to enter the temple and retrieve the mask. The only problem was that Vader was in there. But as it turns out, Tarkin and the senators who want to try and blow up the temple would help with this, albeit unintentionally. The reason for this is because as the Jedi and those back in them were discussing their plan with Momin, Moff Tarkin, with the approval of those who did not believe the Jedi, would already begin the initial stages to execute their plan, which was to destroy the temple. And as a first step to minimize casualties, Tarkin would order a large portion of the area surrounding the temple to be evacuated, 
To keep the people away from the blast radius, the area was already evacuated but Tarkin wanted to use a very powerful explosive which would have a very large blast radius. And so, because of that, an even larger evacuation was ordered in the area surrounding the temple. Belongani and the others would find out about this and would of course disagree with this move, citing that it might not destroy General Skywalker and that even more lives could be lost as a result if they went through with it. Bail and the others would argue to at least let them try out their plan first with the Jedi before taking any extreme measures. And as a response to Bail's arguments, Tarkin would have an emergency session of the Senate called to discuss the concerns of Bail and his ilk. But this was really just an act. Tarkin believed he was doing the right thing and simply wanted to distract Bail and his supporters as he, Tarkin, carried out his plan. And so, following this, Bail and some of the senators that were with him would begin to make their way over to the Senate building to take part in this emergency meeting, which is when an opportunity to enter the temple arose. Because suddenly, through a live broadcast on the holonet, the cyborg General Skywalker was seen leaving the temple and using his hand hair limbs to make his way over to what seemed like the Senate building with extreme speed too, leaping from building to building with the aid of the Force and with his cybernetics. So what happened was that when Tarkin ordered the area surrounding the temple to be evacuated further, Vader sensed it. And General Skywalker knew what was most likely about to happen. And he also knew that things like this cannot be done without the approval of the Senate. So basically, even in this deranged state, Vader's mind figured out that they were about to try and blow him up and that the Senate has most likely given approval for this measure. And so, having realized this, Vader, figuring he needs to deal with this problem, leaves his meditation and goes to the Senate building to let them know exactly why they should not have moved forward with this plan. And as soon as this happened, the Jedi saw this over the holonet, and immediately Obi-Wan and Yoda made their way over to the temple. They then entered the temple through a secret entrance, which by the way is the same entrance that Jocasta New uses in the original timeline to enter the temple after Order 66. Anyways, after entering the temple, the two masters would retrieve Moment's mask and immediately leave, knowing that Vader could be back any moment. And when they returned, the masters would learn of what Vader did. He walked up to the Senate, easily made his way inside despite the heavy security, killing all those who stood in his way, following which Vader entered the actual Senate chamber, where senators had gathered for the emergency meeting that Tarkin had called. And then Vader, just like how he killed the separatists on Mustafar, would close the exits to the Senate chamber and then proceed to kill every single senator inside with a yellow lightsaber, which Vader found in the temple archives. But luckily, not everyone died. The El Mon Mothman and the others had not reached the Senate building from Fiona Republica when this happened. Tarkin would also survive as he was overseeing the whole blow up the temple mission from elsewhere than the Senate. So following this, the plans to destroy the temple would be abandoned as Tarkin now realizes that Skywalker, who can use the Force, will sense it before it happened and that next time, he might start killing civilians. And so, in the end, the temple won't be blown up and Vader would go back into his meditation after slaughtering the Senate. So, with the temple spared from Tarkin's explosive ambitions and the Senate in shambles, it was now time for the Jedi's daring plan to take shape. But first, they needed someone to don the mask of Darth Mormon. And it was Master Luminara and Dooley who volunteered for this daunting task. She understood the risks, but her unwavering dedication to the Jedi Order and the greater good made her the perfect candidate. Master Yoda would also assure Luminara that once the mask of Mormon was removed, she would go back to her usual self, probably needing a strong cup of tea, but otherwise fine. So Master Luminara would put on the mask and moments later, she would speak in a slightly modulated voice. Luminara, or Mormon, would now say, Master Yoda. To what do I owe the pleasure? In the following discussion, Yoda would explain to Moment the situation and how they need to use a thought bomb to deal with this Vader. Moment would then think on this for a long moment before telling Yoda that a thought bomb cannot be created unless there were multiple devotees of the dark side present, which there wasn't. And given the situation, Moment would suggest an alternative. Moment would tell the Jedi that if he were to rebuild the machine he used to try and destroy a city and freeze its inhabitants in time, then he, Moment, can use his machine against Vader, freezing him in time. And in the end, left with no other options, the Jedi would consider Moment's offer. But there would be arguments made about how there isn't enough time to build this ancient machine. To which Moment would say that he can immediately offer the designs to the machine. And further, after being pointed out that the entire workforce of the galaxy is at their disposal, the Jedi 
and their supporters will see that the machine can indeed be built pretty quickly. There would however be concerns if Moomin was trying to somehow deceive everyone. But Moomin would explain that he simply wants to create art and freezing a dark lord of the Sith in time would be an art piece worthy of the dark side's power, Moomin would say. But despite this, Moomin would be kept under constant watch by Jedi. And so, with the sinister guidance of Darth Moomin, the Jedi and their allies would embark on this stony mission to construct Moomin's ancient machine. The blueprints of it, as intricate as they were ancient, were provided by Moomin, and the galaxy's resources were pooled to bring this ambitious project to life. Essentially, the construction of this machine became a race against time. But during this time, several other attempts were made to confront or contain Vader, each ending in failure and tragedy. One particularly bold plan involved a group of elite Mandalorians. They infiltrated the Jedi Temple, hoping to subdue the cybernetic Sith Lord, but even their Beskar armor and combat experience were no match for Vader's growing power. And in the end, the Mandalorians, despite their bravery and skill, fell to Vader's overwhelming might. Other attempts were met with similar fates. A coordinated strike by the Coruscant Special Forces, a cleverly designed trap involving explosives, and even a bold but futile ambush by some of the galaxy's most feared bounty hunters, all were effortlessly crushed by Vader. It also seemed as if Vader's connection to the dark side of the Force was intensifying, the Holocron's influence making him more powerful and unpredictable with each passing moment. Meanwhile, as all this was going on, the construction of Moment's machine progressed at an astonishing rate. Working around the clock, engineers, droids, and even volunteers from across the galaxy toiled to bring this ancient design to life. And eventually, in a reasonably short period of time, the work was completed. The final product was a marvel of technology, a chilling embodiment of Moomin's twisted genius. After the machine's completion, the Jedi, their allies, and Moomin prepared to use it. So, not wasting any time, Moomin, possessing Luminara, entered the machine and with the help of a few Jedi, directed the machine towards the 25,000-year-old Jedi Temple. Also, a side note, in the original timeline, Moomin does tell Vader that he cannot use the Force as he is just a spirit possessing a mask. This, however, in the original timeline, turned out to be a lie, as Moomin was later seen effortlessly using the Force to open a dark side portal. So Moomin could still use the Force in the original timeline, even though the people that he possessed were non Force sensitive. But here, in this alternate timeline, on top of being able to use the Force even though he was just a mask, Moomin was possessing a Jedi Master. So, point is, Moomin can use the Force to work his machine. So with that being said, let's get back to the story. So the Jedi, mainly Yoda, knew that Vader would sense when this machine of Moomin's approached the temple. So Yoda realized that they had to keep Vader distracted to prevent Vader from thwarting their plan. But seeing as how trying to fight Vader was pointless, Yoda, along with Obi-Wan, would come up with a different plan. They would go to Vader and reveal to him that Padme died only after giving birth to Luke and Leia. This, the two masters believed, could allow them to keep Vader distracted long enough for Moomin to make his art piece. But the masters also realized that this could cause them as well to become frozen in time. But that was a sacrifice Yoda and Obi-Wan were willing to make. And so, as the plan was set in motion, Obi-Wan and Yoda approached the temple and quickly made their way inside. In the depths of the temple, Vader, still lost in meditation and the dark side's embrace, sensed an approaching disturbance. And this was of course the presence of Obi-Wan and Yoda entering the temple with a heavy sense of purpose and a flicker of hope, as Vader could sense. And just like how Vader could sense Obi-Wan and Yoda, the Masters could sense Vader as well. And so, the Masters started making their way closer to this presence that they were feeling. And as they got close to Vader's presence, Obi-Wan called out, Anakin, his voice filled with a mix of sorrow and resolve. Hearing this, Vader finally roused from his meditation, and then walked over to face the two Masters. His yellow lightsaber ignited in a cybernetic arms grip. The sight of his former master Obi-Wan and the Grand Jedi Master ignited a whirlwind of emotions within Vader. And yet, he did not move, simply standing there, observing the two Jedi as they stood before him. Obi-Wan, maintaining a calm yet firm demeanor, implored Vader to listen before giving in his rage. And then, as Vader stood there, observing the two Jedi, Obi-Wan revealed to Vader the faith of Padme and the existence of his children, Luke and Leia. Hearing this, Vader's mechanical breathing would become erratic a mix of rage and disbelief swirling within him. He lowered his lightsaber slightly, as if the weight of Obi-Wan's birds had physically affected him. Lies, Vader would yell in his modulated voice. Yoda would then add to this, Truth it is, hope they represent. Not too late it is to change your path, Anakin. 
Hearing this, Vader's grip on his lightsaber would tighten. The ghost of his past, the pain of his present, and the uncertainty of his future converge in this moment. Vader's eyes, visible through his helmet's lenses, would be glowing yellow, as Obi-Wan noticed. Suddenly, within an instant, Vader will lash out with a wild swing aimed at Obi-Wan, who narrowly dodges it. Then Yoda will leap into action, his green lightsaber clashing against Vader's yellow blade. The sounds of their sabers colliding would echo through the temple halls. As his battle raised on, Obi-Wan and Yoda would be fighting to keep Vader distracted for as long as they could. Their movements are calculated, designed to keep Vader engaged and away from sensing Mormon's machine closing in. Meanwhile, outside, Mormon's machine would begin approaching the temple, with Mormon inside determined to create his masterpiece. Inside the temple, however, Vader, fueled by anger and pain, would fight with ferocious strength, and despite their skill, Vader would manage to defeat Yoda and Obi-Wan. He would manage to cut Yoda's lightsaber in half, following which Vader would force push the Grand Master away, and then Vader would direct his attention fully towards Obi-Wan. Vader, now a towering figure of cybernetic fury, would relentlessly press attacks against Obi-Wan. The season Jedi Master parries and dodges his blue lightsaber a blur against the onslaught. Despite his valiant the first, however, Obi-Wan is clearly outmatched by the augmented might of Vader. So mere moments later, Vader, in his swift motion, would cut off both of Obi-Wan's arms. And then Vader would prepare to remove Obi-Wan's head from his body. But just as Vader prepared to deliver this finishing blow, a familiar voice would cut through the chaos. Anakin, please stop. Ahsoka Tano, her voice filled with a mix of shock and sorrow, steps into the fray. Seeing Ahsoka, Vader would direct his attention away from Obi-Wan, unknown to her. At which point Ahsoka would again speak, Please stop Anakin, this isn't you. Hearing and seeing Ahsoka would calm Vader down, just enough to not want to kill Obi-Wan right then and there. Ahsoka would then approach Vader. At this point, in his modulated voice, expressing a hint of surprise, Vader would say, Ahsoka. Vader's attention would now be fully focused towards Ahsoka, Anakin Skywalker's former apprentice. Ahsoka would plead with Vader again to stop this madness, to which Vader would say that he will soon have the power to bring Padme back, and that he would not let anyone, even Ahsoka, stand in his way. Ahsoka would then tell Vader that she's trying to help him. To this, Vader would prepare to say something, but right before he could say it, Vader would send something. Something dark. So, because Vader's attention was split between Ahsoka and Obi-Wan, he failed to sense the presence of Darth Mormon's machine, which at this moment, Mormon activated, following which a wave of energy cascades down the machine, enveloping everything in its path, including the temple and those inside. Vader, realizing the impending doom, would raise his hand in a futile attempt to ward off the inevitable. His figure, caught in this act of defiance, is at this moment frozen in time. Obi-Wan Ahsoka and Yoda would also be caught in the blast and would instantly be immobilized. Their expressions, a mix of resolve and shock. The temple would then fall silent, the only sound being the hum of Mormon's machine as it completed its grim task. Outside, the onlookers, Jedi, engineers, droids, and others who had gathered to witness the culmination of this desperate plan are stunned into silence, and Darth Mormon, still possessing Luminara, would stand triumphant in his machine, looking over his creation. A masterpiece, Mormon would murmur to himself. So, what do you think will happen now? Do leave your thoughts in the comments below if you got the time, and goodbye, and have a good day.